to get started here and see if we can do this in a reasonably quick fashion. I think this will be just fine, so I'll try to flip back and forth between those two as we go. That way uh, we won't have to all turn at the same time. Notice this morning we're going to talk about the word worship, what it means. Uh, what does it mean? Well, Webster's defines it as reverence paid to a divine being or to perform or to take part uh, in worship. Now, that means all of us. All of us are taking part of worship, even though this morning Walker had our opening prayer and uh, Norman had our singing. Uh, all of us participated in kissing towards, if you will, or worshiping God. Followed along with Walker's words, plus adding our own. And we sang psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to each other, encouraging one another and teaching one another. Therein is the idea. Easton's Bible Dictionary says it's homage rendered to God, which is sinful if it's rendered to anything else, any created being or created thought. The original Greek had the idea to kiss towards, and there are several Greek words that are translated that. Proskuneo is probably the most popular, to kiss towards. Sebomai means to reverence or something that is adored. And then you have uh, several words translated serve. Uh, this is where we get our word let, uh, liturgy, let, liturgy uh, and it has the idea of uh, working, you know, rendering service in the community. We would even say that policemen, firemen, so forth, or, or do this. Lutreo, work, serve, uh, sometimes rendered service for hire. So uh, there's confusion when it comes to that. What do I mean by that? Take a look with me, if you will, in the King James Version. This is Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Now, he's just kind of took a parenthetical uh, deal there. From Romans chapter 9 through 11, you basically have Paul leaving his main argument there and talking about Israel for a moment. Uh, and um, then he comes back in chapter 12. And picks up, uh, we call that one of the Paul's digressions. He just He's talking about something else. Sometimes preachers, when they're talking about one thing, will digress into something else, speak about that, and then come back. It's, it's totally biblical. That's what Paul's just done here. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 12, he's changing the whole theme. He's going to be talking about what we need to do in practical parts as he's been dealing with the law before. He says, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. We no longer take lambs and offer them up. We no longer take bullocks. We don't offer pigeons and things of that nature as they did in the Old Covenant when they would go to the temple and offer up sacrifices. Paul says, render your bodies. Uh, of Corinthians, he'll talk about the body being the, to the temple of the Holy Spirit. He says, render your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Well, that's in the King James. But the um, English Standard Version does that differently as long as with some of the other uh, more current, I would say, uh, newer translations. Reasonable service is in the King James, but notice spiritual worship. And so that's caused a, a lot of confusion uh, even amongst our brethren. A lot of folks say, well, you know, uh, service and uh, worship, uh, you know, they're, they're different things. And, and not only that, but notice as we uh, go through life and we're rendering our bodies as a living sacrifice, it is worship. And so you would have those who hold the position that everything that you do in life is worship. And folks, that's just not true, as we'll see in, in the Bible here in, in just a few moments, the way the Bible uses the word worship and going to worship, coming back from worship, things of that nature. But in doing that, uh, people have tried to authorize stuff in worship that God has not authorized. Even our own brethren who know that we need authority for what we do. So a lot of people don't care. They just do whatever they want to do. They vote it in or the preacher likes it or the, you know, whoever's in charge there, they just do it. They don't look for authority. They don't look to the word of God. They just simply do whatever it is they want to do. And uh, then later on, if somebody asks them why they do it, try to give some reason, you know. But uh, that's not what the Bible, and so this is, this caused some confusion. And so children are usually young people, they're like, well, we like to listen to music, you know. And uh, so as long as we're, you know, uh, doing that at home, we're, we're worshiping God. So why can't we use that same principle when we're at worship and, you know, use instruments of music when we worship God? And so uh, you had a few years back that difference between uh, 
uh, praising God and worshiping God. Praise songs, you could use instruments. Worship songs, you couldn't. And so just overall confusion along those uh, lines. And I think sometimes the verbiage used in some of the newer translations helps confuse the situation. Uh, I think something that can help us understand this, though, is to remember all worship is service, but not all service is worship. It's kind of like saying all priests are Levites. In order to be a priest, you had to be a Levite, but not only did you have to be a Levite, you had to be from the family of Aaron. You had to be even more specific. So we can say all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. It was more narrow, and that's what it is with worship. Service can be a lot of different things. But worship is a specific thing that we do, especially when we talk about, I hate to even use this word because it's not used in the Bible, but it has the idea of corporate worship. What do we mean by that? Well, when the church assembles, when all the members come together upon the first day of the week, it's called corporate worship, uh, but it's just the assembly. When we do that, uh, it has a starting place, has an ending place. Notice Acts 8.27. This is the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian nobleman, if you remember says, and he arose, this is Philip, arose and went, behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of her all, all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem. Why did he go to Jerusalem? He went there to do what? Worship. He didn't worship all the way from the time that he left Ethiopia, all that way that he got there and then worshiped, and now on his way back he's continuing to worship. No, he went there for a specific purpose. And uh, let's take a look also at Acts 24, verse 11. This is Paul before Felix. Remember, three times we have uh, the conversion of Paul mentioned. Here he's giving a, uh, a defense of himself to Felix, the governor. He says, because that thou mayest understand, but there was but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem. Why'd he go there? To worship. He went there for a specific reason. Uh, notice Genesis 22 at verse 5. You know the story. God tells Abraham to offer up Isaac, his only son. Abraham goes. And he's going to do that very thing. But notice what he tells the fellows that are going to stay with the livestock, if you will. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. What were they doing? They were going somewhere else, going to act. Here we're going to Mount Zion, or I mean, excuse me, Mount Hermon, or uh, where Jerusalem is going to be, Mount Zion one day. But anyway, he's going up there to offer up his son. And he says, when we get there, we're going to worship, and I will come again to you. So there's the idea. Go yonder and worship. Worship has a starting place. Isaiah 66, 23 says, It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me. God's saying you're going to come here and when you get before me, you are going to worship. It has a stopping place. Notice 1 Samuel 1, 19. Uh, you know the fellow's name, Elkanah, takes Hannah. They go to worship, but notice what happens. They rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house. What did they do? They were in Jerusalem. They got up. They worshiped. They left and went home. So it had a stopping place and a starting place. You might say, Ron, I get that. That's ridiculous. Why do you spend so much time with that? Well, it was something that has caused great confusion. And I just want us to understand that worship is something that I stop doing what I normally do and start doing that. And then stop that and go do what I normally do, which some of that, what I normally do, may very well involve service to God. But worship is more specific than that. John chapter 4, if you turn your Bibles there with me, we're, this will be our text this morning. The other places we'll go, I'll try to throw them up here on the screen. But in John chapter 4, verse 20, beginning, you're familiar with this story. This is the Samaritan woman at the well, Jacob's well. Jesus has gone there. His disciples have gone in town to get some bread, get something to eat. He's hanging out there. And when he's hanging out there, here comes this lady. She's going to draw water. She has her water pot and all that. And they get into a discussion. Jesus says, I'm thirsty. Give me a drink. She's like, whoa. You know, who are you, a Jew, asking of me a drink? Usually you guys won't have anything, uh, you know, to do with us uh, like that. Then he starts talking about the living water. That If you get this living water, you'll never thirst. And she's like, well, she's all about that. Give me this living water. That way I don't have to come out here every day and draw water from this well. And Jesus tries to explain to her that he's talking about a, a different kind of water. But notice he says, uh, the woman said unto him, verse 15, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come I hither to draw. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband. Well, she says, I, I don't have a husband. He says, that's right. 
Thou hast well said, Thou have no husband. You've had five husbands, and the man that you're with now is not your husband. Well, she's not liking that a whole lot. So she wants to change the subject. Notice what she says. Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. In other words, no way that you could have known this. You don't know me. You're not from around here. We're Samaritans. You're a Jew. So you must be a prophetes. You must be a prophet. And she says, our fathers, now she's going to kind of try to change the subject. She says, our fathers worshiped in this mount. Obviously, she's pointing to Mount Gerizim. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. What does Jesus say? Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. There's going to be something that's going to change. He says, you worship, you do not what? In other words, you don't have any idea what you're doing. You go up to Mount Gerizim and y'all just make things up and you do it, you don't know what you're doing. He's not saying that, you know, you're stupid or anything of that nature. He's just simply saying that you've not been told to do that. You don't know what you're doing when you get there. Many today are assembling throughout our nation, throughout the world, and they are doing what they don't know. They have no idea what they're doing. What they're doing is not in authority with what God's will. It's not God's will that they do the things that they do, yet they're doing them, and they know not what. Notice what Jesus says. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But he says, The hour cometh, and now is, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father seeketh such to worship him. Now notice this. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What I want you to see from this, this is nothing new. This is not something that Jesus has just come up with. This is a well-known fact that's been going on forever. Notice back in, well, since God's been revealing his word, notice back in Joshua 24, verse 14. Joshua says, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Notice that. In sincerity and in truth. Same thing we're talking about. In spirit and in truth. And he's saying this, uh, you know, 1,500 years before when the law of Moses is given. This, of course, is uh, the history of Israel. Moses has died. Joshua is now leading Israel. And he says you need to worship God in spirit and truth. In sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side. Of course, we all know verse 15 when he says, For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Notice also, if you will, Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 1. Here's two boys. Two, you will, call them boys. They're young men. They're, uh, they're the sons of Aaron. They're going to be the high priest. Nadab would have been the next high priest. He was the oldest. But they're in line to be the highest position you could have under the old covenant. The high priest, the one who on the day of atonement would go into the holy of holies and sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat. That's who these folks are. These folks had ate with God on Mount Sinai at the giving of the law when the 70 elders, Nadab and Abihu, were there. They were very special. But notice what happens. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them their censers. Now, a censer, just picture something you would burn incense in. And put fire therein. In other words, they lit it. And put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Notice it was strange. What's strange about fire? You might say fire is fire. That's right. The idea is <coughs> it was fire other than where God told them to get the fire. There was a particular altar where they were supposed to get the fire that they would burn their incense with, and they didn't do that. They got it from some other place, and the Bible says it was strange fire, and notice, which he commanded them not. Most of you are familiar with the story. God strikes both of those young men dead, and then he tells their father Aaron not to mourn them not to mourn them. He says, I will be reverenced. And see, brethren, this is one of the things that I appreciate uh, about folks, uh, especially our congregation and several congregations I know of who are really concerned with what God says. And they look for authority in what they do. They want to make sure, well, where does the Bible say that we need to do this or not do that? And so they want to know what God says because, you see, God holds us accountable. God did not tell them to get the fire from the place that they got it and they just presumed that it was no big deal. Fire's fire, right, man? You know, whether it's a big lighter or a barbecue grill lighter or, you know, whatever, it's fire. It meant something to God, and God was specific about where you get the fire. Now, we'd have brethren today who would scoff at that and just make fun of it and go, yeah, fire, right, and make it out of gopher wood instead of pine. Yeah, the, all those things you always like to talk about with specifics when it comes to authority. Well, folks, this two young men lost their lives here 
simply because they didn't pay attention to what God had told them to do. And many people today don't think that God cares one way or the other how we worship, as long as we're sincere in whatever it is we're doing. Well, these young men were sincere, but they were destroyed as a result. Uh, there's a couple of places. Uh, I want you to read this quote with me for, uh, first. It says, <clears throat> first, what does it take, friends, to constitute an act of worship which meets God's approval? It says, I submit three necessary elements. First, it must be directed unto God, the right object. Second, it must be done in spirit, which means prompted by the right motive, actuated by the loftiest purposes, and suggested on the part of the performer by a disposition to meet with the pleasure of high heaven. In other words, we're trying to serve God, trying to do what God would have us to do. And thirdly, that act must be in truth uh, or according to God's word. That's from Hardeman Tabernacle Sermons, 1923. If you don't have a copy of the Hardeman Tabernacle Sermons, let me encourage you to do that. It's five volumes set. One of the volumes is hard to get. The others are in paperback. Uh, great, great, uh, great orator and great matters of truth. It's a great quote. Uh, from years ago. But notice, the Lord's people have had trouble with this from times immemorial. And what does immemorial mean? Some of the past that you can't even remember. It's, uh, we've had problems with that. Let's take a look, first of all, here at Isaiah 29 at verse 13. And I'll try to do that here so that, uh, well, how am I going to do that? There is a way that I can do that, and I don't know how it is. My apologies, brethren. You know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to do the old-fashioned way. I am actually going to have to go and get a Bible. I didn't bring my Old Testament with me. Because it also appears, uh, for the most part, in Matthew 15, 9, and in Mark 7, 7. So that's one of the reasons you'll say, like, hey, I have heard this before. Isaiah chapter 29 at verse 13. And it figures it'd be on two pages. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people... Now remember, we're writing somewhere around seven, 750 years before Christ. This is Isaiah the prophet. The uh, northern kingdom hasn't been taken away yet, much less the Ju Judah, the southern kingdom. He says, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips. In other words, what are they doing? They're coming to worship. They're coming to worship. They draw. They're talking about me. They do uh, With their lips, they do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. See, they're not worshiping in spirit and in truth. They may very well be going through the motions of offering up sacrifices, going to Jerusalem, but the heart just isn't in it. He says, and their uh, fear toward me, he says, remove their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. Precepts, what is that? The commandment of men. In other words, they're teaching traditions. They're teaching what men say. They're not teaching my word. Notice with me, if you will, the very last chapter of the book of Isaiah. I want you to see this. Uh, I just happened to be going through this uh, chapter this week and uh, really struck home. Notice what, what is happening here. Of course, God's going to talk about heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool, verse, footstool, verse 1. Uh, everything is mine, he says. Notice in verse 3. He says, he that killeth an ox. Now, it was commanded to kill bullocks, to kill oxes, okay? There was a, there was a sacrifice that was made with that, for that. He says, he, he that killeth an ox as if he slew a man. Wow. He that sacrificed a lamb. Now, lambs were offered as a sacrifice for sins as he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation. An oblation is a gift to God. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. Now, you know, pigs were unclean animals. What's he saying? These folks, the things that they're doing, they're doing, they're going through the motions. Man, they're offering up ox, the bullocks, you know. They're offering up sheep. They're offering up oblations or gifts as, a, as he offered up swine blood. And he that burneth incense, priests are burning incense, as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways. And their soul delighteth in their abominations. In other words, what are they doing? They're going through the acts, but their hearts are not right. Uh, notice in verse 6, he's going to talk about, excuse me, verse 5. He's going to talk about people who are trying to do right. 
He says, hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Not these who are just going through the motions and, you know, whatever they're doing. If their heart's not in it, they don't care. He says, hear, hear the word, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you. In other words, these folks who are just going through the motions and do worship other gods and everything. That cast you out for my name's sake. Here the faithful are being run off by the folks that aren't faithful. These people are just doing whatever they want to do in worship. They're teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. And they're getting after those folks who are trying to do what God has said. Brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. Shame. They're, they're ashamed. There's going to be a reckoning. There's going to be a reckoning, and God is going to hold into account these folks. Notice in Jeremiah chapter 7, same thing. Now we're about 100 years uh, later, if you will, uh, Jeremiah is going to preach to the southern kingdom. The, uh, the two kingdoms are still together. Well, not together. You have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Israel to the north, Judah to the south. Isaiah is basically a prophet to the uh, both kingdoms, particularly in Judah, but he, you know, he's preaching to the northern kingdom as well. They're taken away into Assyrian captivity. A hundred years later, Jeremiah is preaching to the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom's gone. And he's trying to get them to mend their ways. Notice what he says in Jeremiah 7. Now, these are the Lord's people, folks. These are not pagans. This is not folks in Rome or Greece or Germany or anything of that nature. These are God's people, the Jews. And notice the problems they're having. Notice verse 8 of uh, Jeremiah chapter 7. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. You steal, you murder, you commit adultery, you swear falsely and burn un incense unto Baal. In other words, they were into paganism. And walk after other gods whom ye know not. And then notice what they do, verse 10. Come and stand before me in this house where they're supposed to be, which is called by my name, and say we are delivered to do all these abominations. In other words, it's okay, we do whatever we want. Verse 11, in this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But now he says, you go and look at Shiloh. Now Shiloh was the city which the tabernacle stayed in. It was an area where the tabernacle was. This was before the temple was built. God destroyed Shiloh. That's what he's showing them here. He set my name at the first. And see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people, Israel. He said, you were wicked then, I destroyed that place. And now, verse 13, because you have done all these works, saith the Lord, I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking unto you, ye heard not. And I called you, and ye answered not. Therefore, I will do this unto this house, which is called by my name. Verse 15, he's going to, in other words, end of verse 14, going to do the same thing here I did at Shiloh. Verse 15, I will cast you out of my sight. I will cast out all of your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. You see, brethren, this is nothing new. God's people have had a hard time staying with what God has said. It is the nature of men to leave to go away from what's being done, what God says do. It's just, it's, we did it in the garden, kind of got it all started. Old Testament Israel is example after example after example of God's people going beyond what God has said and then a lot of times not doing what God has said, just simply doing what they want to do. One of the things that we try to emphasize is that whatever we do in worship, we must have authority for it. We must be able to go to the Bible and show that this is what we must do. Not to some book, not to some publishing house. Had some folks visit my house Friday with their, uh, you know, they brought their little track that they have with them that they're so popular with. And uh, during the course of our conversation, I said, you know, we could be brethren if you would simply take that track on which you base your religion. They have a track society which publishes out materials by the millions of pounds, and unfortunately it works. They have disciples and people all over the world that believe in their doctrine, which is established by this series of tracks that they've put out for 100 years. I said, if you would put away that track and go by that book right there, then we could be brethren. He looked at me and says, I've got eight and a half million brethren. I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that my soul doesn't mean any more to you than that. But what separates me and you? We both, he, he kept going to the Bible. And I say, that's great, man. Let's go to the Bible. But put away that book. You put away that book that separates me and you. But they wouldn't do it. You see, it is the nature of men to add to what God has said. Or select parts of 
what God has said. Think about the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. You've heard it said, but I say unto you. Jesus wasn't coming up with something new. He was just telling them all the things that the Pharisee of the day or the, the, the teachers of the day had omitted. Oh, they were all about, oh, you can't commit adultery, but you can look at the menu. must have been what they were saying. Because what did Jesus say? I tell you, if a man look upon a woman to lust after he committed adultery with her, already in his heart, he's saying it's, that's where it comes from. That was in the Old Testament too. There was the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And yet they didn't obviously didn't teach that because Jesus has to emphasize that in Matthew chapter 5. So this has been going on for a long time. That's why we spend so much time with the Bible and we teach from the Bible and the Bible is our only guide and we do not appeal to sources outside the Bible for our authority. Notice real quickly, we want to look at the action that's required from John 4, verse 24. The action is simply worship, to kiss towards, to kiss towards God. God is our aim. Notice God is our aim, and it's absolute. What do we mean by that? It's a must. This is not something you go like, well, you know, I don't want to do it. I'm just going to stay at home and, and worship God in my house. Uh, you know, I don't need to assemble with the saints upon the Lord's day and break, you know, a commandment of, of the Hebrew writer there. No, that's not true. You must worship God. It's absolute. Your attitude is just as important, notice, in spirit as the authority in truth. You've got to have the right heart. You just can't come to worship and go through the motions is the idea. Notice uh, action. The action here is worship. The worship of the church involves at least five components. We'll hit these very quickly. First of all, we find prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, the idea of uh, prayer is, uh, uh, well, let me go through. Prayer, singing, giving, teaching, and preaching, and the Lord's Supper. Prayer, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Pray means to pray towards, to ask towards, to petition towards God. The idea of singing, as we've done this morning already, speaking unto yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody into the hearts of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I will sing with the spirit, I will sing with the understanding. Uh, the idea of singing, teaching each other. Also giving upon the first day of the week, the disciples noticed. He said, I've already told the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in stores. He's been prospered. The idea of teaching and preaching, Acts 20 at verse 7. Notice upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. That was the worship of the first century church. And we use this same verse for the Lord's Supper. Notice upon the first day of the week, they, uh, they took the Lord's Supper. They, uh, they came together to break bread. And so we try to do that very thing today. Notice the aim should be God. God has always been the focus of our worship, must be the focus of our worship. Micah 6 at verse 8, uh, you know, a lot of people try to complicate uh, how we approach God. The uh, people of Israel were doing that in Micah's day, saying, well, what will the Lord be satisfied with? The blood of, a, a, you know, a thousand bullocks, uh, rivers of oil, the death of my firstborn. And Micah said, oh, no, he has showed you, old man, what is good and what is right, what the Lord doth require of thee, but to do justly. Love mercy and walk humbly with the Lord. Jesus, when fighting with the devil, the devil trying to get him to do things he not, shouldn't do, what did he say? That it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. God is the object of our worship, not a statue, not a statue that represents God. Remember, that's one of the things that uh, the Lord was upset about. You don't make things. Don't you make things and bow down to them. I don't care what they look like. So don't make things. Uh, absolute, the idea of must. Uh, you know, Paul says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Folks, that's a have to. You don't have a choice in that. You're going to die unless the Lord returns. You're going to die and your spirit's going to go to the Hadean realm. And then one day we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Christ is going to tell us where we're going to go. We're going to be judged. Uh, the judgment's already been done, if you will. The sentencing is actually what's being spoken of here. And then the attitude, this idea of spirit. Uh, Paul really nails this home. He's talked about obeying the gospel in the first part of chapter 6, that uh, we're raised to walk in news of life. But notice he says, Thank me, God, you know, but God be thanked you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart. Your heart was into it, your emotions, your mind. You knew what you had to do, you did it, and you did it because you wanted to do it, and you did it in truth. And obviously that's uh, what's being looked at here. And then the authority, this idea of truth. Where do we get truth? 
unlike so many today who will turn to their book of prayer or their catechism or their particular tract or their uh, synod or their conference, uh, the Bible says that we are set apart, sanctified. That's the idea, set apart, set apart, set apart for holy use. Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Okay, Lord, what is truth? Thy word is truth. That's how we are sanctified, and that's how we please God. And as it is the nature of men to leave the truth and to go do things they want to do, and then come up with arguments like, well, surely God wouldn't this, or surely God wouldn't that. I know that was probably on the lips of Nadab and Abihu when they got that fire and said, well, surely God wouldn't matter mind where we got the fire. And in actuality, it meant a great deal where they got that fire. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ. The plan of salvation is, is here for you. What is the plan of salvation? Well, we find in the Bible that people heard the gospel. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. They were motivated to believe it, to, to do something that this, that's right. I want to obey the gospel. So they did that. How did they do it? They repented of their sins, the changing of their mind, changing of their ways. They confessed the Lord that indeed he was the son of the living God and that God had raised him from the dead. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And they were immersed in water for the remission of their sins. And the Lord added them to the church. Acts 2, verse 47. Doesn't stop there, though. No, that's where we begin the walk. And in that walk, one must be faithful. Revelations 2 at verse 10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. The Bible tells us that uh, you know, he who endures to the end will be rewarded. It may be the case you're in need of anything. Uh, you need to obey the gospel. You need to come back home. You need to confess public sin, whatever it might be. We stand ready to serve you in any capacity as together we 